We've come out to uh, Hollywood, California. We're in the Cecil B. DeMille building on the uh, lot at uh, Paramount Pictures. And uh, I can hardly believe we're, we're here. Uh, how many times have we seen the, the mountain and the stars on the screen? Yeah. But we're behind that gate now with one of the stars uh, of uh, radio's great days and so many other things, too. Uh, Elliot Lewis is with us, and we're happy to be here and happy well, to have a chance to talk with you, Elliot. It's a pleasure to have you here and uh, to have nice weather for you and to welcome you <laughs> to Paramount and the mountain and that beautiful backing they have that they just put up, uh, uh, maybe noticed it when you drove in, behind the tank, which will be the setting for the new uh, Barbary Coast show which uh, I would guess had better be an enormous hit after looking at the work <laughs> they put into that tank. Or they'll never pay for it, and they're going to have to sell this whole building. You may have seen the last of this lot. <laughs> it may close uh, any time. It may close any time <laughs> if that show doesn't work. <laughs> you know, uh, I have long waited for an opportunity to tell you face-to-face -face that um, you and Phil Harris on the radio as... Uh, as Phil and Frankie Remley mm -hmm. were to radio, in my mind, what Laurel and Hardy were to movies and what Gleason and Kearney were to television. Well, thank you. I, I, those, I remember those days with the utmost fondness. I don't know when in my life I have so enjoyed uh, a job. It was just absolutely marvelous job. When I realized that we did that for nine years, Phil and Alice and I, and Walter Tedley and Sheldon Leonard. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, to digress a moment, I had not acted in 20 years or 22 years or something. Sheldon Leonard is acting and hadn't acted in a long mm -hmm. time. He's doing a new show called Big Eddie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi Aberback, who's another friend, is the producer and director of the show. They called me three weeks ago and said, uh, you want to come over and have some fun? <laughs> and I said, doing what? And they sent me a script, and it was cute, and I'm on Saturday night. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> First time. I haven't seen it. Everybody said, gee, it was well. But I remembered those days because working with Sheldon suddenly reminded me of, of uh, what fun that had been. There's number, acting in comedy, I mean, in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. And I don't particularly like to act. I don't enjoy it. But I do like that. I had a marvelous week, and it reminded me of what you just yeah. said, which I hadn't thought of in I don't know how long, but that was the exact same thing on that show. It was just fun, it was just wonderfully refreshing, the two characters yeah. and the way it played and the relationships. And well, the rapport that you guys had was marvelous. And well, you know, I, uh, Jack Benny, who was uh, uh, my teacher, really, I was here in Los Angeles when I was still going to school. I was going to uh, junior college down here. And right across the street is the KHJ building. When I was 18, I worked over in that building. It was then NBC. It had just been built. And I worked in that building for Jack Benny. And then on and off I worked for him for whenever, all of those, all of those years. You mean on the air? On the air as an actor, never playing Remley. Always another character, because yeah. Remley never appeared until he appeared on The Harris Show. But Jack was always fond of, of uh, Phil and me and of what we were doing and was most helpful and uh, kind of guided us and gave suggestions and everything. And I remember sitting down with him one day and I said, please explain something to me. I know that when Phil and I work that it's funny and the jokes are funny, but I don't understand why the laughs are so big. What, what, what are we doing? He said, well, you found a wonderful thing in that relationship, you two guys. The two of you say and do what everybody in the audience would like to say and do in a similar situation if they had the nerve. But nobody has that kind of nerve that, that you two guys have, and that's what people are <laughs> laughing at. They're just delighted. Because it always surprised me. You know, we'd say something you know, like you stick Tetley in the oven, and he says, let me out, let me out, and you just wait and say, what do you think? You know, people are screaming. <laughs> and it is, as you think about it, it's ridiculous. You don't leave somebody in, a, in an oven. But to, that we would even consider it and think about it and stand there and, and say, well, I don't know whether, you know, and talk about it. And this poor, poor soul is in the <laughs> oven screaming and yelling and banging on the oven door. So it's very kind of you to remember that. And I had just, as I say, I just remembered it myself a couple of weeks back. Well, there was one where, where Phil and... Uh, 
and Remley were, you know, they were marching down the street behind an elephant or something, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on, on Hollywood Boulevard yeah. or some such thing like that. <laughs> and I can remember, uh, I've just heard this not too long ago, as a matter of fact, and I, you know, there could be no way that you could do that on television. No. Uh -uh. Never. No. We did one, I remember, that uh, uh, Dick Chevrolet and Ray Singer wrote, uh, where they buy a racehorse. And the description of the racehorse was so hilarious. And, of course, you couldn't do it on television. You can't get a horse who is running slowly or cannot run more quickly because his stomach is dragging. <laughs> <on the ground. laughs> but, you know, that these men would buy this and then consider it. They're talking about it. Say, does it, you know, does it look right to you? And, you know, I think there's something wrong. The old, no horse shouldn't look like that. And that they're, you know, it, it marvelous marvelous relationship very well written by uh, Ray Singer and Dick Chevrolet they wrote the whole series huh? they didn't write the first it started 26 on the, on the weeks Fitch band so. wagon, didn't it? right and I wasn't on it at first I was doing something else that, and Remley real real Frank Remley uh, it's a left-handed guitar player who worked mm -hmm. with Phil's band and worked on the Benny show and Dear, dear, marvelous man. Well, they decided when Phil and Alice had their own show, they decided that, you know, the thing to do would be to use Phil's best friend, Frankie. So they wrote it in and they said to Remley, you know, here you go. And he got up and he couldn't read it. He was a guitar player. He wasn't an actor. <laughs> so I had worked with the, all of them a long time on the Benny show. And we all knew each other and were close friends. <clears throat> and I was doing a show down the hall. And Phil came in, they did the first show without me, and he came in and they cut the Remley thing, and he said, we're, we're going to write Remley in on the second show. And, you know, the script is ready, and we have to establish the relationship, and well, could you come in and do it, and it'll take you a couple of hours, and then that'll be the end of it. And I came in, and I did it, and uh, we got the kind of laughs that I've been describing to you, which neither of us understood, and we did it every week for nine years. But that's how it happened. I think... Uh, Mosier and Connolly wrote the first 26. Joe Connolly and Bob Mosier wrote the first 26 sh shows. Mm -hmm. Then Ray and Dick wrote it until possibly the last year when they were off on something else. And I have a memory of Marvin Fisher and Jack Douglas mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. working on the show. Because I remember Jack wrote some wild, wild material. He's so funny anyway. Funny stuff. But... Singer and Chevrolet were responsible for the show, and, and uh, was there Rexall? I started with Fitch, and then Rexall came right. in there, and then RCA had it in the last couple of years. In we the, were into working, the 50s more. yeah, we were working for uh, for the dog, his master's <laughs> voice. You know, I remember that uh, taking a couple of trips, and you know where you're, you're helping with the advertising and everything. And I remember those little statues. Mm -hmm. What was the dog's name? Didn't Crosby do a Nipper? Picture? Nipper. Was it Nipper? Isn't it Nipper? Yeah. yeah. He's the head cocked as he's listening yeah. in front of the speaker. I remember that very well. Well, you did so much more in radio uh, than, uh, I shouldn't say than just the Phil Harris and Alice Faye show, because that was, that actually was one of the greatest, funniest comedy shows on radio with a storyline with the variety Phil and Alice singing. Yeah. Um, but the continuity of characters, as you said, the. Uh, Walter Tetley was was uh, Julius. Julius, the delivery and, uh, boy, and Sheldon was all kinds of things, and was in and out as a friend of uh, uh, Phil's and Frankie's that Alice couldn't bear because he was so obviously conning <laughs> everybody the way Lenny does. I have to ask uh, yeah. uh, on the Benny Show whenever they referred to Frankie Remley, he was of course Never a heard lush. Him. Yeah. He was a drunkard. Now, yeah. was he really? Oh, no. That? No, no, no. Very sweet, nice, quiet man. And uh, a really dear man. And, uh, I remember when he passed away, which is, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago now. I remember that I, re I had a real pang. Uh, and I hadn't seen him in years. But, but he, was, he was a dear man. A very nice man. It's interesting how they made a fictional character out of a real person. Yes. Well, that's uh -huh. the secret of Jack Benny. Uh -huh. Jack Benny, who was the comedy genius of all time and who taught all of us, 
that was his theory that that uh, you know you made jokes out of nothing. They would make a joke out of something that started at the beginning of a half-hour show. By the end of the show, you're laughing hysterically. Mm -hmm. Nothing funny, really. It wasn't a joke, but it was just uh, you know the gas man and and uh, the car and the, all of the things, the the train to Cucamonga. And <laughs> I remember a routine we did on the Benny Show, where every year. Jack and the group go to New York, and that therefore is the scene in the railway station. And Frank Nelson is saying, yes, he's selling tickets, and Jack's in line, and Mel is on the speaker going, and <laughs> come on, you know, and every year we did this. And I was always the man in line in front of Jack, and Jack's trying to get a ticket, buy his ticket to go to New York. And the first routine that we did, and the reason we then continued it, was that we took the lyric of uh, Glockamora and all I did was read the lyric and Jack was very nervous about it he said I I don't know do you think you, you ought to be crazy or you know is that gonna be funny and I said I don't know it just seems to me that it's funny if I just ask Frank Nelson these questions how are things in Glockamora <laughs> And he says, fine. And I said, is that little brook still rippling there? <laughs> and he said, oh, yes. Well, you can imagine. <laughs> and you're doing this, Frank and I talking, and Jack Benny is standing behind me just staring at the audience with that look, you know, when you did the elbow. <laughs> stuff. Well, that, that, what is funny about it? I don't know. It's just, but it was, it was funny. It was funny stuff. And so well, Jack would create these characters and he created the the image of Phil and the image of therefore Remley. He created Phil and Remley uh, image for them and characters for them so strong that Phil and I and Alice and the, the real little girls were in the uh, Santa Claus Lane Parade on Thanksgiving down Hollywood Boulevard mm -hmm. one year and it was freezing cold and without thinking, we each took a mug of coffee, hot coffee. And the girls were all bundled up warm, and one of them, the kids sat on my lap, and the other kid was on Phil's lap. And we stopped at one place, and I reached to get the coffee. I was really shivering, I was so cold. And I picked it up, and Phil, without seeing that I was doing it, did the same thing, and he picked his up. And we had stopped, and there were crowds on either side of the street, and they started to laugh. They thought we were drinking booze. <laughs> they thought we were stoned, you know, and you don't know what to do. You got a little kid on your lap, and the audience is laughing because they think you're drinking whiskey, which we weren't. No. We're just hot coffee. You know. But that's how f firmly the, the Benny show created those characters and established those characters. I remember doing a show he created, Jack created for those characters, the fact that they were musicians who hadn't the faintest idea what they were doing knew no more about the music business, had no more right to be musicians. This was so firmly established that on Phil's show, then years later, we did a scene that I still recall of a music rehearsal. Phil is conducting and Remley's playing guitar, and Phil stops and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, doesn't sound right. What have you got there, it says to Remley. And Remley says, I got, there's a black dot, and then another black dot, and the audience started to laugh. <laughs> now you figure they'd have to be musicians to know. They didn't. They just know, knew that we hadn't the vaguest idea what we were talking about. And Phil said, I think there's supposed to be three black dots. He said, no, there's one here that's a white dot. <laughs> and he said, where is it? And I don't know, whatever the thing, that's a fly. No, that's a real, <laughs> you know, all of these jokes. But people were laughing because the characters had been established by, by Jack. There was one series uh, of shows in, in the uh, Harris and Fate sequence there that uh, were somehow or other you, as Frankie Remley, signed the contract with Rexall instead of Phil. And uh, Phil was, for two shows at yeah. least it went on, you know. And Al, you were going to team up with Alice and oh, do the sure. whole thing. I remember the biggest laugh we ever got, and I, I really, to show how little I know about, about what I'm doing, I had no idea would get this kind of laugh, and it made me kind of nervous. The story very simply was that Alice says to Phil, 
He is not, Remley is not your friend. He doesn't really care about you. He's a terrible, vile person who was looking to take advantage of you, and you've got to be very careful. And Phil keeps saying, no, 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 no. That's not true. And they keep putting things in the way until finally they say, Alice, Phil says, all right, I tell you what. When he comes to the door this morning, you tell him I just died of a heart attack. And then you'll see what a friend I've got. Well, I thought, my goodness, are we really going to do that? Play the scene in front of the audience. Doorbell. Alice goes to the door. She's crying. And Remley says, what's the matter? What is it, Alice? And she says, Phil just died of a heart attack. And there was a long pause, and I said, Alice, will you marry me? <laughs> well, I tell you, we couldn't not stop the people from laughing. The studio was shaking. <laughs> it was just this explosion of laughter that he had the gall. <laughs> didn't even wait, didn't say, gee, I'm sorry, nothing. Couldn't wait to get his hands on that money. You know. <laughs> And I thought, well, no, you, we really can't do that. Ray and Dick said, it's funny, do it. Just do it. Phil said, don't worry about it. Well, they were right. Did, did you have to do a lot of rehearsal for that show? No. As a matter of fact, by the time we were in our seventh, eighth, and ninth year, we were on tape. The show was no longer live. And we would record. We'd tape the show on a Friday for Sunday broadcast. And we would meet at around noon, around 11 o'clock in the morning on Friday, and read the script around the table, and then make some cuts and changes, and get, go get our lunch, and come back and read it again on mic to balance it, make additional cuts and changes. And then I was producing and directing over at CBS. So Phil would go and do his business, and Alice do whatever she had to do. I'd go over and work on scripts for her suspense or on stage or Broadway or one of the shows crime that I was doing at CBS and come back uh, dressed to do a show in front of an audience at 5.30 and uh, the audience would come in 5.30 or 6 o'clock and we'd do a little warm up and do the show from 6.30 to 7 and Phil and Alice got on the train went back to Palm Springs and I went home and that was it so we would devote most of a Friday to it and that, of course, by that time, the characters had been so uh, oh, finely yeah. refined and uh, right. keenly developed. And, and the, the yeah. you're able to do in radio, especially in ra comedy in radio, a kind of humor that you cannot do anywhere else. And once it is set up, as you have just said, the characters are set up, the situation is set up, and you have the kind of writing that we were getting from Ray Singer and Dick Chevalier, uh, there are no problems. Everybody knows what they're doing, or they wouldn't be there. And if, uh, if it wasn't a good show and the audience didn't like it, it wouldn't be on the air. You know, you find out very quickly whether it's working or not. And as always in almost anything, but especially in show business, if it's going easily, it's usually on the right track. Uh, it's not hard to have a hit. It's hard to have a failure because it's rough. You know, you keep trying to fix something that that you should just throw away. Uh, when it's going well and all of the elements are together, wow, you know, and it's, uh, no problems. It just runs. And then you said something about working in the, on the suspense in the production. And the write, did you do some of the writing for that, too? Yes. I, I did writing and editing and produced and directed uh, Radio Suspense for about five years, I guess. And then uh, while I was married to Kathy Lewis, uh, we did the on-stage show for a couple of years, and I wrote the openings and the closings and did the editing on it. And E. Jack Newman, with whom I'm working here at Paramount, uh, contributed, I would guess, half of the scripts mm -hmm. and during the two years that we worked on that show. Also wrote, goodness knows, how many of the suspense shows. As a matter of fact, he and I were talking the other day. There was a thing we would do together that was kind of fun because it was a kind of challenge in the mystery sense. I recall... Uh, saying to him one day, I'm driving into work, I had seen a scene in my mind, which was a marvelous first act curtain. So I said to Jack, you know, I just see this guy's, somebody's chasing a man, and he's in the fun house at an amusement 
car. And he knows he can't get out the front door, so he tries to get out, find if there's another exit. And in the back of this building, there's an enormous uh, animated figure, a big, jolly kind of a animated stuff thing. And its arms are at its side, and it goes, ho, 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 ho. And as it's doing ho, ho, the arms raise over its head, ho. And then the arms go down. And the man describes this in the narrative, and I said, because what he does is he times it. And the guys are chasing him, and so he waits, and the figure goes, ho, 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 and the arms are up, and he's going to make a dash. And so he waits, and he times it, and goes, ho, 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 and he starts to dash, and as he starts, the arms go bang, cut off. Uh-huh. There's a door behind him when it raises. And as he heads for the door, the arms come down, and from inside the figure, a voice says, you didn't really think I was going to let you get out, did you? <laughs> so I said, I don't know who he is or how he got there or how it ends. Jack says, great idea. <laughs> and he wrote a script that was called The Giant of Thermopylae. A marvelous suspense. That was on suspense. That was on, that we did on suspense, yeah. We did a lot of them that way. Was this in the um, late 40s, then, the suspense, uh, when you were on, involved? Yes, I did it... Uh, after I had been on suspense uh, working with Bill Spear, for Bill Spear, as an actor and a rewrite man, and also writing originals before World War II. Then I was in the service and uh, didn't do any work for that, although I was working for Army Radio, Armed Forces Radio. I was in charge of uh, what they called commercial denaturing. (laughs) <laughs> which was a division with uh-huh. Duff. Uh-huh. Howie and I yeah. were doing that together. And we did. We supplied 476 radio stations, Howie and I and three other guys, with 120 programs a week, which we took off the air, edited, took the commercials out, took out anything, that any dating material. By edited, I mean anything that... that uh, would be considered information that you didn't want broadcast worldwide. Mm-hmm. These were then placed on acetates, sent to the short wave stations, then masters were made, they were printed, and they were shipped all over the world, all of these 470 odd radio stations. So I was busy doing that. Then when the war was over and I went back onto suspense, Spear, Bill, who was doing Sam Spade and Suspense, uh, wanted to do a picture in Europe with his uh, wife uh, at that time, June Haddock, and with James and Pamela Mason. It would be based, James and June would be the stars. Pamela had written a book that she was doing the adaptation on. Dick, uh, Bill would produce and direct the film. So he wanted to get out of his deal. and. Uh, he suggested to CBS that since I'd done so much work on it and I was doing, uh, producing and directing another radio show for them at the time called Broadway's My Beat that David Friedkin and Mort Fine were writing, that I should produce and direct Suspense. They were agreeable, and so that's when I picked up mm-hmm. Suspense and Bill went off. And I think I did some of the spades for him, too. I don't remember. You were Gregory Hood. I was Gregory Hood. Uh-huh. Yes. The casebook of Gregory Hood. Casebook of Gregory Hood, Anthony Boucher. And I thought of it the other day. I was reading, somebody was uh, wrote a lovely thing about Anthony Boucher, about what a nice man he was. And I met and I had the privilege of meeting him in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. He was up there so much, of course. He was the crime uh, uh, reporter, the re- reviewer for the New York mm-hmm. Times while he was alive. He was a fascinating man. And the casebook of Gregory Hood, we did down here. Howard McNear was Sandy. I remember they used to, uh, they'd write at the end of a scene, Gregory Hood says so-and-so and so-and-so, and and then they'd write for Sandy, makes funny noises. Because Howard McNear would always, (laughs) I'd say, well, let's get going then, shall we, Sandy? And Howard would go, (laughs) no one can do it the way he did and it was marvelous, and it was always that kind of a thing. Here's another very, <coughs> very nice man. Uh, before, a lot of good people in this business. Before you uh, uh, took over the role of Gregory Hood, I think Gail Gordon yes. was... Yes, um, Gail and I had known each other for years, and in the, the true manner of show business, I was called one day 
to the Young and Rubicum Advertising Agency. And they said, we have a property called Gregory Hood. Have you ever heard it? And I said, well, it's on the air, isn't it? And they said, yes, but the, the, it's not working out the way we want it. We would like you to be the star. And I said, what happened to Gail? And they said, well, we've told him, and he agrees, and, uh, you know, no hard feelings or anything, and they were trying it. And so, uh, you know, come to rehearsal Monday, and you're Gregory Hood. I said, fine. I walked into the studio, and there sat Gail. Nobody had said a word to him. <laughs> So I said, Gail, why don't we go outside and have a cup of coffee and have a little talk, because we were old friends. So I was the one who was supposed to have been all arranged. I was the one who said to Gail, I'm doing Gregory Hood now. I guess you're not. didn't matter, of course. You know, well, there. he had a scratch for work then through the rest of his career, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> yeah, he really was desperately uh, <laughs> looking here and there, trying to find something to do. And then when I was producing the Lucy show on television, of course, there we are working together again. Uh -huh. I'm producing the show, and he's, uh, as a matter of fact, when we started the, the television series, uh, the Lucy show that I produced, is when she came back from New York and she and Desi had been divorced, she was about to marry Gary, the whole thing at the studio was going on, and uh, uh, Bob and Maddie and uh, the two Bobs were writing the show, and we all needed, we sat around and we said, gee, we need somebody that really can, you know, hey, let's get Gail, and that's how that started. We wrote in the Mr. Mooney character, and Gail came in. And well, he stayed with Lucy then. Until it finally went off the air a year right, or so ago. Right. You followed him again on a um, on another uh, series called Junior Miss. For a while, I believe you played uh, Judy Graves' father. And before you, or maybe it was after you. I don't know. He was in there too. I think he may have followed me because I remember doing. That was the one Shirley Temple did, didn't it? Junior uh, Miss. Yeah, it was Junior Miss. I don't know if Shirley actually. Uh, I did was Junior on. Miss with Shirley. Oh, well, that was pretty. And early I then. played her father. And I was playing her father the week I was drafted, so I was like 22. <laughs> I was playing Shirley Temple's father, and I did the Junior Miss show on a Thursday or something. Waved bye bye, and Friday went into the army. So I think Gail followed me on that show, and then I think Shirley dropped out, and they did another version mm -hmm. of it later on. We're talking another funny, there was a show called uh, Date with Judy that was mm -hmm. on for a long time. And one of my friends out here also is uh, Dick Crenna. And Dick and I were kidding one day because I said, you know, you may be famous for, for the playing the part of Oogie on a, a Date with Judy, but I created it. <laughs> he said, I didn't know that. And I said, yeah, it was a mistake. There was, it was a double. I was there doing something else, and there were a couple of lines in for a kid named Oogie. So I did it, and my voice broke, and you know, played the part of Oogie, and and I was busy doing something else, and wasn't really very good anyway. And they called Krenna, and Krenna did Oogie on a, on a date with Judy. <laughs> it's hard to believe all of those things happened because we did so many shows, you know. How busy were you at your busiest? As far as being, of course, I you, think you I had counted a good one mix. week. I did twenty shows mm. in one capacity or another. I was finally, uh, uh, in the late 50s, or middle 50s, I guess, I was produ involved in the production, direction, acting, whatever, on five weekly series. My desk at CBS looked like a joke. I was doing the Harris show as an actor. I was producing and directing suspense. I was producing, directing, editing, writing openings and closings, and co-starring in On Stage. I was producing and directing uh, Broadway's My Beat, and I was producing, directing, and writing the openings and closings and editing crime classics. And at one point, CBS had three of those shows on back-to-back -back on Wednesday night. And by taping parts of this one and sections of that one, because you couldn't record the music, music had to be live mm -hmm. and had to be put in when you went on the air, and having adjoining studios, uh, studios one and two at the old CBN. I was able to do it. I was on the air. I had a show on the air from 5.30 to 6. And I had a show on the air from 6 to 6.30. And I had a show on the air from 6.30 to 7. I mean, to f network feed. Some of them, uh, 
I think the 6.30 to 7 was also live on the coast. The others were, they came on at a later hour. It was Elliot Lewis night on CBS. Yeah, it was ridiculous. You know, there's no reason for that. It was just silly, but that's just the way the, the scheduling yeah. happened. I want to back up to your uh, Army career for a moment or so. Yeah. You, uh, uh, you were working on the editing and the yeah, all of those dubbing uh, those uh, commercial the, the radio shows. Right. Uh, did you start that? Were you the first one to get involved with that? How, I think Howie and I were. Yeah, mm -hmm. we uh, Duff. When I say Howie, uh, we were both in the service at different places, and were called here by. Uh, Colonel Tom Lewis, who we had known when Tom was, was uh, head of Young and Rubicon. And he needed people who knew radio, and he had this thing starting, and he needed people to take over this job that had been handled by Don Sharp, who had been an agent and a producer and everything else in town. And at that point, I believe Don was working for, was it the OWI? Office of War Information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was working for the OWI, and they were trying this, but nobody had done anything with it yet. So there, Duff and I were there, and uh, we're called in, and they said, now here's what we want to do. And as a matter of fact, some of the things we developed, uh, well, I, I won't be bashful. Some of the things we developed worked so well that I was given the Legion of Merit oh, for, uh, mm -hmm. for developing this uh, new techniques in, in recording and broadcasting. How did you Only get because the there was no other <laughs> way to do it. Well, but the, you know. that was... We had through three civilian crews working seven days a week, 24 hours a day, to reassemble these shows that, that uh, by the te techniques that we developed, cut mm -hmm. this, pick up here, and so forth. And this is before tape. Mm -hmm. We were doing this editing off of acetate. So we got so we could look at a turntable playing at 33 and a third speed and drop the head on a word or a, a spot. You, you could look at the grooves in the right light mm -hmm. and, you, and you, know, you know exactly where you are and what you're doing. You picked up the shows as they were being broadcast, more or less, right off the line. Then. Off the line at radio recorders. They were taken off the line. Howard and I would pick them up in an Army vehicle, which was given to us occasionally. The rest of the time we were to use our own car and our own gasoline and were never reimbursed for it. And we had to be very, very careful because we had a stack. Th these were not aluminum-based mm -hmm. acetates. They were glass-based. And we had one guy cut in front of us on the way to the studio one night, and we lost two hours of programming because the records just slid, and that mm -hmm. was it. Nothing you could do about it. They were gone. But uh, they were glass-based acetates that we took off the air, we picked them up, and what we tried to do with the immediate shows is that we would make worksheets on a typewriter as the show was on the air. So when we picked it up and delivered that acetate to uh, McGregor's or to Universal or to the other part of the division of radio recorders, they had the worksheet and the crew knew exactly what they were going to do with that, and by the following morning that show would be ready to, to be broadcast shortwave so that we were watching a clock timing when uh, uh, a commercial began, when a new opening was to be put in, this would be to taken out, what the fill material was to make up for what we... Uh, you had always had to pad everything. it back to 30 minutes again, or right. 29, whatever. 29, 30, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it got to be quite a thing. As I think about it now, I don't know how in heaven's name we did it. Because as we were typing, we were listening to a show and watching a clock. And uh, what you I never did, did learn though, how to type. I mentioned this to Howard Duff. What you fellas did there, and you really didn't realize you were doing it, but you were really preserving the sounds of radio from right. the forties. Right. Because the There's networks a never no. never wanted to keep it, you know, and they just did it live, and they didn't copy There's it. There's a complete record of all of that stuff, and I believe uh, Armed Forces Radio Service mm -hmm. still has those things, and they still do it. Somebody told me that they had heard me, heard my voice, on a program broadcast over the Armed Forces Network somewhere in Europe six mm -hmm. months or so ago. Because what we did, if we didn't have enough material coming off the line to make... 52 weeks of something. We invented, so we invented uh, the Mystery Theater. Mm. Now, the Mystery Theater had to have a host because sometimes it would be Mr. and Mrs. North, sometimes it would be uh, Inner Sanctum. 
whatever was on the air that was a mystery show that we could use. Mm -hmm. We'd grab and we'd put it on. So we had our own opening and our own closing. Now, whichever of us went down with the record, with the transcription to make the show also recorded an opening and closing for that show. So we had to invent characters because we, it was not the same person. So there was Corporal X and there was Sergeant <laughs> Y and we did all of these things. Whoever went down was Howard or was Jerry Hausner or was me or, or it was uh, uh, Jimmy Lyons who was part mm -hmm. of our group and now runs the Monterey Jazz Festival. But uh, we all fell into the patterns. Alan Hewitt uh, loved opera and symphony. So he would edit opera and symphony. Uh, Jimmy Lyons, who was doing Monterey, loved jazz, knew all of those people. He did all of that kind of music. Uh, Howie and I did the, the dramatic things and the comedy things. Hausner did all of those and did also uh, 15 and 30 minute original shows for everybody. But we were kind of the lost group. We were in a, in a, in a side corner because uh, uh, the big shows that this uh, uh, Armed Forces Radio Service was doing were command performance mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that that people talked about and let's get out there and do it and they did one command performance a week while we were doing 120 shows and nobody even knew we were there you know we were just off in the back somewhere did you ever meet uh, G.I. Jill there was sure. a little 15 minute uh, oh sure <coughs> Marty uh, <coughs> Williamson what, what's Marty's last name all I can think of is a married name it's Mort Warner's wife Mort Werner is the, was the head man at NBC mm -hmm. Television for I don't know how long. I think Mort's trying to retire now. G.I. Jill was Marty, was his wife. And Mort, who at that time was a G.I. with the rest of us, Corporal Werner, was uh, kind of producing and directing his wife's little show. You know. What I, you know, I heard a lot of those G.I. Jill shows now. What did she look like? Marty's a very, very, she was a lovely looking young woman. She's a very attractive older woman now. They've grown children. I don't figure they're contemporaries of mine, so she's no longer a young woman. Uh, not a raving beauty, just a marvelous looking woman. Warm, very attractive. I th to me, she always looked like what she sounded like, you know. That's uh, great. That's yeah. good. It, it was just wonderful. And a she had Lovely, to be every girl person. next door for every GI right. around the world. But Marty primarily was a writer. She wasn't doing that. She wrote, has written many, many, many television things. She wrote for the uh, Robert Montgomery yeah. show, wrote original material for it. A you were, uh, back to civilian life, you were the lead, I believe, in a um, kind of a another version of the first Nighter program called Knickerbocker Playhouse. Yes, they called me... <clears throat> to go to Chicago. That's when I went to Chicago in 39. I knew nothing about this program. I was working as an actor on a lot of shows here, and one of the shows I was working on was called Silver Theater, which was a Sunday afternoon drama. And occasion I was under contract to them. The AFRA, AFRA at that time contract stated that you could pay people if you signed them to a 13-week deal, they got scale less 10%. So I was on the contract to Silver Theater in Big Town at that time. Now, on Silver Theater, some weeks I had four lines, and some weeks I was the, the leading man opposite whoever the leading woman was. And this one time, they had heard me opposite, as a leading man opposite uh, Ginger Rogers or somebody, I don't know who. And they were out here, and I knew nothing about this. And my agent called me and said, there are some people here from Chicago, and they would like you to audition for them. There's some kind of radio show that they're going to be doing in Chicago. And they're over across the hall, and would you go over and read something for them? Now, I'm in the middle of a Silver Theater rehearsal, playing the lead opposite Rosalind Russell, a darling, lovely, gifted, talented lady. So I came back in, and I must have looked puzzled, and she said, what's the matter? And I told her, and she said, well, we'll stop rehearsing for a little bit and go over and do it. It could be a big job for you. I said, I don't know what to read. She said, let's read what we're doing. I said, we? She said, sure. Don't tell them who I am. We'll go over and we'll read. I'll, I'll read with you. We went across the street to, to this other studio and uh, went in, and I still don't think they knew who it was. She said, tell them I'm Miss Brown. <laughs> so I said, this is Miss Brown. She's going to read with me. And they said, fine, how are you? And fine, we read the scene, which we'd been rehearsing for two days. 
they said, thank you very much, and I said, thank you, and Roz and I went back and did our work. And the following day, I got a call from my agent, and he said, they want you, the show is called Knickerbocker Playhouse, and it's going to come from Chicago, and they want you to be the star, and uh, you want to go to Chicago this summer, it's Firm 13. So I said, well, I've never been in Chicago, that sounds like a lot of fun, I'll drive to Chicago. And I did, and uh, they said, bring a tuxedo, because they, uh, they get all dressed up. I said, I didn't know where to live. And she, so I checked into the Medina Club, which was across the street from the Wrigley Building, and do the show there. Then I got an apartment on Wabash. And the woman to whom I have been married for these 17 years, Mary Jane Croft, was coming through town on her way to New York. She had been working in Cincinnati. And that's when we met one another. Then she married somebody else, and I married somebody else, and she was divorced, and I was divorced, and we'd been married for 17 years. And we met in Chicago, 1939. The at seven, City. Yeah, yeah 720, 720 North Wabash. I thought you were going to say that they didn't want you, but they wanted the Miss Brown. Huh? <laughs> yeah, they wanted Ross. Uh, <laughs> no, I told them later uh, who, who it uh -huh. was, and they said, well, we knew. And they sure didn't act like they knew. Uh -huh. They had any idea who she was. You you played in um, I Love a Mystery and One Man's Family. Just as an actor that was uh, roles, yeah right you know. called in because they were all friends. We all worked in anything. Yeah. You know it didn't matter. It was marvelous, and it, it was because uh, you could do anything. You you go in and you do four lines, or you wrote it, or you were directing it, or you produced it. Mm -hmm. uh, every everybody was interchangeable, and it was uh, it was a marvelous way of working, a very pleasant way. Uh, not too long ago. Uh, might have been just a year or two back, you were involved in the production of uh, New Time Radio as opposed to Old yes. Time Radio. Yeah, we did. I uh, got a call and somebody wanted to do a show and uh, we worked out a format and a thing with uh, Rod Serling, bless his heart, as host. And I did uh, 65 half hours for them. And uh, then they sold it to uh, the Mutual Network and decided that I don't know what. I was never consulted. I don't know what happened to the show after that. Somebody else did it. Uh, they decided they'd go non-union, and they bought some uh, old radio scripts from someone and said, well, we'll revise these. And I heard a couple of them. They were very disappointed. And the show was canceled. It didn't do well with it. Not that it, it uh, would not have been canceled if I had continued, but uh, I think that there's an unfortunate thing in the entertainment business. If, if it's properly done, whatever it is, what you do, what I do, what Jack does, if it's properly done, it looks to somebody on the outside like, well, that's nothing to it. You know, I can do that. I just turn on a machine and hold a microphone in the fellow's face and ask him questions. Great. But there's more to it than that. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of people have come in in the history of the entertainment business, from the Greeks, I suppose, where somebody said, well, you know, if he thinks he can write a play, what do you see what I write? <laughs> you know, what's, what's so great about the frauds? I'll write a play called uh, The Gypsies or whatever. You know, well, there's a talent to it. So a lot of things get screwed up, unfortunately. You're uh, quite busy these days, uh, and exactly what are you doing right now? Right now I'm working on a couple of projects with uh, E. Jack Newman, and... Uh, we just completed uh, yesterday the presentation for uh, the pilot of a new show. And if you heard any typing during this discussion, that's what's being <laughs> typed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see if uh, we're going to proceed. While we're waiting on that, we have two others that uh, uh, Jack and I have been working on. And uh, so that's my immediate uh, uh, project. Uh, as I told you, I had the the pleasure of uh, standing opposite Sheldon Leonard and, <laughs> uh, and acting, which was quite a thrill a couple of weeks ago, and uh, that pleased me. Is that it? Are you on the premiere show now? No, it opened last week. I'm on the That's second right. show, yeah. which is the one that... Uh, coming uh, up now. The next one coming mm -hmm. up. And as a matter of fact, I got a phone call from a friend last night. Uh, Mary Jane and I were sitting watching television. The phone rang at 9 o'clock, and an old friend called and said, didn't you see yourself? And I said, no, that's not till Saturday. And uh, Joanne said, 
no, 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 you're in the promos all this week. Oh. She said, they're just a promo. <laughs> you and Sheldon are just talking, at, uh, just ahead of Hawaii Five-O. So I'm anxious to see the promo to see what uh, what I look like as an elderly person. <laughs> I haven't seen that in 25 years. Well, you have had an interesting career when it will still continue, and uh, you're not an elderly person. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I know on the, on the show. No, no, I just meant <coughs> physically as, as I look at the image. I say, well, who's that? That doesn't look like the guy that was in Chicago. Well, it isn't, except it is. No, no, I. Have to, I uh, and all of us, that uh, E. Jack, David, Mort, you know, all of us who work together, have worked together in so many different relationships and capacities for so many years. You always think of yourself as the way you always were when you sure. talked about yeah. Phil. You know, I saw Phil maybe a couple of years ago. He called. He was coming into town. Wanted to know if I want to have breakfast with him because he's an early riser. Because he w was in the band business for so long, the two things he hates are staying up late and wearing a tuxedo. <laughs> and his idea of heaven is if you go to bed early and you get up at 5.30 and you wander around and see a sunrise, fresh, not just as you're ready to go to sleep. And if you wear old clothes and hang around the kitchen and cook and do things like that. So we met and we had breakfast and chatted and it's like uh, we hadn't seen each other in five or six years. And just picking up where we'd yeah. left off. Mm -hmm. I wish you guys could pick up where you left off. It'd be great to hear Frankie and uh, Phil yeah. again. On I don't radio. know what happened to all of those shows, whether he'd be interested in uh, putting them on the radio or not. <coughs> Pardon me. I know that I was asked to do a uh, radiothon a year ago, and they had a piece of one of the old shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know I was laughing wholeheartedly, and your memory of scenes also makes me chuckle. They were funny shows. They funny, were great, funny shows. good, great shows. Yeah, good Thank time. you very much for doing Thank those. Thank you. This and was a lot of fun. I, I appreciated it. Thank, Thank you, you. Elliot Lewis.